Story time. Back when I was a teenager, I once borrowed a pair of Beats headphones from a good friend. I remember I was sitting on the train. When I tried to pick up something, I dropped on the ground. The cord of the headphone got hooked onto the arm of the chair and heavily yanked my phone out of my pocket. And after that, one side of the headphone lost its sound. My mood sank instantly. Because not only it wasn't my headphones, but also it was quite expensive. My friend trusted me and lent me the headphones, yet I broke it. I feel really sorry. I felt like a wounded child. I wanted to call my mom. I needed her to tell me that everything is fine, that it's no big deal. And I decided not to tell my friend until I met him, because it would be useless if I text him now. He could do nothing but worry and concern. And apologize through texting just doesn't seem that sincere. Then as usual, my mind started to play a script of how I would tell him about it. Before I could even think about it, my brain had already reached a conclusion, which was tell both my mom and my friend that the headset just broke on his home. I had no idea how it happened. So this way, I shifted all the blame onto the quality of the headphones. Wait, hold up, whoa. I was surprised by my natural tendency to lie. Suddenly, I started to ask myself, wait, Eugene, why are you doing this? Why do you lie so blatantly? What's the benefit of you doing this? Why don't I just tell the truth? I'm shocked by myself that I can find such an excuse so quickly with no hesitation. Only then did I realize that due to all the years of childhood conditioning, I gradually formed this habit of evading responsibilities and lying to avoid problems. I always meet this kind of people in my life. They always give unsolicited excuses for all their actions and behaviors. Maybe during a basketball game, they missed the two shots in a row. Then they would tell, oh, I don't have the feeling today. I injured my feet a few days ago. I didn't sleep well last night. The sun is too bright. The wind is too strong. The ground is too wet. Blah, blah, blah. To justify why they didn't play well. The implication behind is that my actual ability is way higher. I usually play a lot better than this. First of all, nobody's judging you. Nobody cares about you. Nobody's asking you anything. And nobody wants to hear your reasons. We're all too concerned about ourselves. Second of all, most of the time, you miss that shot because you're just not good enough. Due to the normal distribution of statistics, as long as you make enough shots, you will experience making multiple shots in a row. And you are mistakenly using a number that's two standard deviations above the mean as your ability. But these people keep explaining themselves and become very annoying. In the mindset of these people, they are always right. What's wrong are always the other people, other things, the world, all the external factors but themselves. There's a photographer. People keep on asking him what kind of photography equipment he uses. Probably he got asked it too many times. So once he answered, you ask Picasso what brushes he uses to paint? A tool is a tool. Even if I give you a pen that Picasso used, you still can't draw. All those excuses, those f***ing excuses, have to be stopped. Upon seeing good photos, people usually respond with, nice. What camera do you use? Upon seeing bad photos, people always respond with, uh, what a stinky photographer. Or if you go see the annual reports published by public companies, you will find that when summarizing the result, if the performance has risen, the reason is attributed to the company's precise grasp of the market, reasonable decision making, efficient attribution of resources, and the proper risk control. If the performance has fallen, the reason is attributed to the emergence of unpredictable macroeconomics, new black swan events, or sudden uncontrollable incidents in the company. Success is attributed to your own abilities. Failure is attributed to others, the environment, or objective reasons. In poker, winning money means that you have a superior ability. Losing money Money means that you have bad luck. In psychology, this is known as the self-serving bias. My mistakes are uncontrollable. However, the mistakes of others are self-inflicted. George Carney once said, Have you ever noticed that anybody driving slower than you is an idiot and anyone going faster than you is a maniac? What is your reaction like when you got overtaken by another car and he honks at you? Most people will say that person doesn't know the traffic laws, got personality problems, or temper issues. But what attitude did you have when you were the one who drove over and honks? You may say that, I'm late to work and might get a fine from my boss. I have an emergency with my family. I have to rush over. So that's why. 
After all, we judge ourselves based on our thoughts and intentions, but others based on their behavior and results. In psychology, this is known as the attribution error. We despise the efforts made by successful people to succeed and think that it is good luck and connections, help from parents, or good at ass kissing. I could definitely do it if it was me. Upon seeing beggars and losers, we automatically assume that they're lazy and hiddenest by nature, but they ignore the possibility that they are likely to be the result of a string of unfortunate events. Events. To be honest, we could just be like him, you and me. We're all one step away from the gutter, and one shot of a drug might just serve as that final push. To sum this part up, we think we succeed because we work hard. Others succeed because that person is lucky. Others fail because that person does not work hard enough. And we fail because we're unfortunate. Story time. I was once backpacking alone in Guatemala and experienced a real bad food poisoning. I ate bread with chicken and pork at a food store at a market around noon that day. Before hopping into a minivan, heading to another city. There were about 15 people in the car, all are backpackers like me. The mountain road was curvy and rugged. The van keeps on turning, accelerating, breaking. I've had pretty bad motion sickness ever since I was a kid and by then had already taken off my headphones and looked outside of the car window. In addition, I just camped on a volcano the previous day. My legs were incredibly sore. The night on the mountain was cold. I still had a runny nose until my stomach starts to rumble and tumble. It hurts me to the point of making me bend forward. I had to use each inch of muscle around my any to hold the raging flood from coming out. Then I felt a string of poisonous chemicals shooting on my spine, hitting my brain like a hammer, then sent it spinning at a speed of 100 RPM. I was miserable. I hold my hands into fists, close my eyes, lean back on the seat, praying that the time would pass by faster. After a while, we stopped at a gas station for a break. I rushed to the public bathroom, put my head next to the toilet, and reached into the mouth with my fingers to stimulate the uvula in order to induce vomiting. Then I had to squat on the toilet to do some undescribable crime. When I regained my consciousness, I realized that this is the worst mess ever. After cleaning myself, I pushed open the door and walked out of the toilet. There was a dude waiting right by the door. He was just about to enter, and then he saw all the vomit and other things on the ground. Then he just walked away silently. He didn't look at me, guess he didn't have the courage to. At this point, I could just return to the car and pretend as if nothing happened. After all, nobody in the car saw that, but I felt like I'm a man, regardless of good or bad. I did it. I should bear the responsibility for everything that I did. So I went to the cashier of the gas station and said to the waitress in my broken Spanish, Lo siento, yo hacer el baño sucio. I didn't know how to say vomit or clean such words in Spanish back then. That sentence was the best expression I could make to signify that they might want to clean it. The girl at the counter looks at me very confused, thinking I was being too polite. Little did she know. The journey continued. I felt much better after getting back into the car, thinking that I had spit out all the poisonous stuff. However, an hour later, and half an hour away from the final destination, I felt nauseous again. When we reached a rather straight road, I forcefully tapped the driver on his shoulder. He initially was about to tell me that we're almost there, just hold it. Then quickly realized that this was serious from the look on my face. He stopped. I hopped out of the car. Next, for the people in the car, all they heard was disgusting vomiting sound from a few meters away. Everyone had to turn their head away. A kind-hearted girl got out of the van and gave me some napkins and water. After I got back into the car and sat down, I turned around to everyone in the car and sincerely said, I'm sorry guys, I apologize. Everyone was like, nah, Horus, that's fine, happens, all that. And that's the story. I hope you can start taking responsibilities like a man. That means both taking the credit when you do good and apologize when you mess up. After making a mistake, being able to openly and naturally express apology in a poised, calm, sincere way is a quality a real man should have. By the way, the ending of my vomiting incident was that I finally dragged my body and suitcase to the hostel that night. A volunteer at the hostel brought me a thick blanket, and a Portuguese girl in the same dorm room made me hot tea. And like that, I survived the worst food poison in my life. Studies have shown that when something goes wrong, People who blame themselves are more trusted than people who blame external environments because people perceive the errors as controllable. For example, a company that says our profits are down because of the internal management issues will yield stock increases. However, if the same company says our profits are down due to the economic recession and natural disasters will cause a decrease in the stock price. I once read a story online. 
The author of the story made a mistake at work. Instead of shareholder responsibilities like others, like what all normal people are subconsciously prone to, he said that he's accountable for all the mistakes. He even covered all the mistakes and faults, which were apparently not his. His boss soon realized it and started to tell him that it's not all his fault. That is fine. However, the author insisted on saying he's gullible for everything. In the end, the boss admitted and symbolically punished the author. However, after the incident, the boss trusted the author more than ever. If you're willing to admit your mistakes, then it makes you a more reliable person. In 1846, there was something that spread throughout the entire world called peripheral fever, commonly known as the child bed fever. Basically, what was happening is that there's a bizarre high rate as high as 70% of women who give birth and would just die within 48 hours. In the end, a doctor called Ignaz Semmelweis found out that this is due to the doctors don't wash their hands. They don't wash their hands between autopsies and the delivering of the babies. He precisely pointed out, he said, hey guys, here's my study and here's what you need to do. However, every single doctor laughed at him and called him crazy, insane, lunatic, for 30 years, for one thing, doctors were upset because Simon Way's conclusion made it look like that they were the ones giving child bad fever to the women. In the end, after almost 30 years, people finally learned the lesson after countless unnecessary death of young mothers. Sometimes, you are the problem. The problem is you. Take accountability for your actions. You can take all the credit in the world for the things you do right, as long as you also take the responsibility for the things you do wrong. I encourage you to read Samuel Way's story. His problem-solving plot is like a detective story and much drama involved. It's a very interesting read. I once read this online. You can have whatever the f*** you want, as long as you take the corresponding responsibility. A psychiatrist called Dr. Raj once said, You see, people come to me at my clinic, and they tell me all about the things they want from life and the world that they're not getting, and they are very frustrated. They may want to date, they may want a Ferrari in their garage, or they want a million pounds in their bank account. They always tell me what they want and what they're not getting. What they don't tell me is what they need to give in order to get what they want. You see, at the heart of life is a transaction. You can get what you want from the world and life, but you have to be able to give something that the world wants and you need to give it first. I really like the concept of the equivalent exchange in the Japanese anime, Full Metal Alchemist. If you want to gain something you never had, it means that you need to lose something you've never lost in exchange. If you want success, fame, or be known to the world, then you have to pay blood you never bleed it, tears you never cry, and spend time you will never get back. During school examinations, I often hear various kinds of excuses, not getting enough sleep, too occupied with other subjects, got disturbed from something. Given how much time they spend on social media, I find little validity in their excuses. I think most people are just afraid that if they really study hard and give it all, yet still fall behind many people, it'll be a negation of their intelligence. So they did everything they can to escape facing this ugly truth, so that they can preserve their fragile ego. There is a common phenomenon on the night before the exam. The student would originally decide to reveal all the materials that night. But he saw the video game he could play, or the Netflix show he could watch. He tells himself, I'll just take a short break, then I'll get back to study. But the truth is, he never got off the hamster wheel. He played game after game, watched the episode after episode, until it's too late not to sleep. In psychology, this phenomenon is called self-handicapping, and it's basically someone creating disadvantages for himself from achieving a goal. People are doing this so that they can reduce the impact of failure and prevent yourself from being frustrated, because people are unwilling to accept the reality that they are just not smart enough. By not studying, he could always rationalize it to himself. I certainly can and I am capable. It's just that I didn't want to because of blah blah blah. I'm going to end this video with a story of mine. It was my diverging point of starting to take responsibilities like a man. It was a cold January in Paris. I was doing an exchange program there and stayed with a host family. I remember I went to visit La Chateau de Versailles that day. It was a little rainy, so I borrowed an umbrella from my host home. As soon as I got off the building and opened the umbrella, it broke. It was the common case that the steel arm no longer supports the cloth. At first I thought I could fix it later on the subway, so I didn't take it seriously. I walked to the subway station holding a half broken umbrella over my head. When I was on the subway, I found that I couldn't repair it. The steel arm was broken in the middle, so I ended up carrying this broken umbrella with me all day in my backpack. 
The day trip was nice. When I returned home at night, I put the broken umbrella in my room. I just find it awkward to tell my host mom that the umbrella she lent me is broken in the first place. Yet somehow I still carried it with me all day. And like that, I stopped for days trying to think of a way to explain it. My initial version was like this. Hey, is the umbrella you lent me broken? Oh, cause uh, you know that day, the second that I opened it, uh, you went broke. <laughs> On what appropriate night, I told her, Hey, I'm sorry I broke the umbrella. I left 4 euros on the kitchen table. You can buy another one. But, much to my surprise, she replied, Okay, but I'm sorry dear, an umbrella here costs much more than that. At that moment, I felt repulsed. The kind of feeling when generosity collided with stinginess. But I didn't show any of it. I told her she can check the price and let me know. I will compensate the full amount. In fact, if she asked how it was broken, I would answer it truthfully and tell her that the umbrella was broken in the first place before I used it. But she didn't ask, I didn't bother to explain. So, what's the takeaway of this story? I think that 95 of my concerns can be solved by making more money. And in conclusion, what did we learn today?